everyone. Good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining today's ex, you know, this exciting webinar, a hands-on webinar that we're terming Anatomy of a Cyber Attack, Lessons and Best Practices for the Global Postal Sector. But of course, it can be for anyone. So we're happy to have uh, all of you joining, whether you're from the postal sector or from outside the sector, this will be a benefit to everybody today. Today we have, uh, well, by the way, my name is Tracy Hackshaw. Um, I am from the Universal Postal Union, who is hosting this event. Um, I'm, I'm head of the Dot Post Business Management Unit. With me, um, a colleague from the Dot Post team, Misam Sebra, who will be uh, will be facilitating the conversation with all of you. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, with us today, we have two, I'm so happy to have two well-regarded experts in the field who will give you a brief introduction to themselves, but you can also find them on LinkedIn if you want to get some details as to exactly who they are. So we have um, Mr. Joseph Carson, who is from um, Delinia and based currently in Estonia, but uh, as you may, some of you who know uh, his work, we know him from being around the world doing a whole series of presentations and activities, which is how I found him. And um, I'm happy to have him after chasing him down for some time. Finally, we, we, we locked in a date. So this is great, fantastic to have Joe here. And alongside Joe, we have Mr. James Diva, who is um, also going to give support to this, this webinar um, in terms of giving you some of the potential best practices, um, some ideas of how you can proactively prevent um, the cyber attacks, because you'll see a live cyber attack in operation today, um, run by Joseph. Um, so he'll give you some ideas what you can do to prevent and essentially or hopefully, um, you know, take steps in the event you are attacked, because as some people say, um, it's it's you know, it's a matter of time before something like attempts to come into your net breach your network. So it's really better to be prepared. And if you are attacked, what steps can you take during that attack to avoid being um, completely disrupted in your organization? So happy to have both of you here today. As I you know, wait for the folks, most folks to join. And I think we can start officially now. We have just about maybe about 40 people online. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully the others will come on um, shortly. But I think with this group, we can begin the session. And as you know, this is a recorded, we'll be recording the session. So um, for those who are not able to make the start, they can see the start subsequently. So with that, um, I believe it's a good time to hand over to Joe, who will kick us off with, um, I understand, some slides and then um, a walkthrough or maybe let's say a hands-on appreciation of what a cyber attack looks like. So with that, over to you, Joe. Absolutely, Tracy. Many thanks. It's a pleasure to be here and really excited to share my experience and knowledge with the attendees and the audience. And uh, as, as Tracy had mentioned, what I'm going to go through is it's basically lessons learned from a real-world ransomware attack. Uh, some of the things that went you know, went well, uh, but also some of the things that went horribly wrong. And hopefully, you know, one of the things is this: the victim of this particular attack um, have given me permission to share a lot of the details about what happened. Um, and it's very rarely that you get that permission. Um, so they want to make sure that other organizations around the world uh, can learn from this and make sure that they put the right controls in place to make sure that they avoid uh, to become a victim. I'm going to go set some of the context at the beginning, so I'm going to go through some slides that will kind of take you through some of the, the uh, events that happened. Um, then I'll get into a live kind of walkthrough, um, myself putting myself in the, in the seat of the attacker and walking you through all of the things that they did ultimately uh, in order to deploy and bring the business to complete stop. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to go and share up my slides. So... Hopefully you're seeing this at the moment. So can you just give me some, give me confirmation that you're seeing my slides okay? It's coming. 
we are not seeing any slides as yet. So, and we've seen you started. There we go. Your slides are now visible. Go ahead. Oh. Proceed. Okay. You seem to be frozen. You seem maybe there's something. Your connectivity seems to be drifting a bit. Okay, there's a. Uh, I can't see it. But Joe's fr Joe's, Joe himself is a bit freezing now and then. Yeah, it's just. I think we. I think we're okay now, Joe. If um, you could proceed now. So I think Joe is reconnecting, or is he? Yes, he's reconnecting. So, so while Joe reconnects, um, well, what we could probably do is use the chat. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat while um, Joe reconnects with us. I think he's just changing his connection or his device. And um, let us know where you're from and, and what country you um, you work in. Um, and I've, I neglected to mention if and when you have questions. Um, please feel free to use the um, chat pod to put your comments and some questions in, but ideally we like to use the Q&A function within Zoom. The Q&A function, as you may be aware, is normally in most screens to the bottom, in the bottom menu um, structure next to the participants listing. And you can put your questions there and we'll attempt to answer them there for you. Okay. I so we should, should should we try this again? <laughs> so, for some reason, Zoom just uh, hit uh, Christ and we started again. So, so as I went through, basically, this is the reality check: is is what keeps security leaders and people that's responsible for a lot of IT and infrastructure. It's really what keeps you up at night. And there's lots of attacks out there. There's things from data breaches to financial fraud. We see a lot of business email compromise uh, from insider risks. Basically, most of those insider risks are unintentional. Uh, they're accidental through misconfigurations, um, ultimately some you know, malware getting into organizations, uh, trying to steal credentials, extract data. And all these can result in some type of revenue, brand damage, can have data poisoning, compliance failure. A lot of organizations have some type of regulatory compliance, whether it being things like uh, EU GDPR, whether it being uh, California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, you might have PCI compliance, HIPAA, and so forth. And all these can result in some type of business or service or application downtime. Now, for me, probably the most severe out of all of these is ransomware because it is very destructive. It can ultimately uh, bring the business to a complete stop. And I've seen various different types of, uh, let's say, you know, severities. I've seen it from really large organizations where the complete business has, has come to a standstill and the attackers are demanding, you know, millions of euros. Uh, in ransomware in order to get, you know, to give the keys to get the business back up and running. Ultimately down to small businesses where it, you know, it's basically a, a small family business you know, that's you know, providing some type of uh, a service. And ultimately it's not just about, because you know, in, in the business, the small business that I've had to, to assist with, um, it wasn't just the business that was down, it was actually the entire family's digital life of the last 15 years that was also encrypted. Uh, so not just about the uh, financial data on the business uh, services, but also you know, photographs of their family and grandparents that have passed away that are completely encrypted. Um, and, you know, the attackers at that point are demanding uh, tens of thousands of euros in order to, to you know, get that back. Um, so you get two massive different skills of the severity here. Now we get into it, you know, ransomware has not been, you know, it's not something that's new. It's been around for a long, long time, and there's been many variants over the years. Some of the earlier variants goes right back into 1989, where it was the AIDS Trojan. And this was basically one uh, that uh, was distributed by a floppy disk. And uh, on that floppy disk, it would actually infect the uh, auto exec bat and then basically uh, make the system unbootable. And that, that, that case was actually looking to get the money through basically sending it through the post. So they actually, uh, for just under $200, you would actually send it to a post box in Panama in order to get basically uh, the uh, you know your your system back, so this is something that's been around for a long time. There's been different variants over the years, but it, I think it really escalated around 2013 when we saw CryptoLocker, and that was one of the first that was the first variant of ransomware that leveraged cryptocurrency in order for payment. 
Um, and since then, it's really accelerated throughout the years where we've seen, of course, not Petya impacting lots of organizations back in 2016, um, really bringing you know, a lot of the supply chain logistics companies um, and shipping companies to complete standstill. Uh, you see you know, the likes of Maersk and uh, Merck, two large organizations becoming victims of that and bringing their business to complete standstill. You see also RYUK, you've got um, uh, Our Evil and others that basically continue in order to cause havoc over the years. Now, ransomware is continuing to evolve. It's not just about the crypto type of ransomware, it's about you know, bringing the machine to a complete standstill. Ransomware has evolved to exfiltration, uh, denial of service attacks and screen lockers. One of the things that we've seen in the last year is that uh, you know the, the traditional ransomware, which is very noisy, uh, which basically brings the business to stop and control the systems, tends to get very, very high public visibility. Um, the public tend to know very quickly that this organization is experiencing problems. Um, and therefore they know, you know, typically from that, the employees start, you know, mentioning on social media, um, their partners and suppliers and customers can't access their services. So those crypto style ransomware becomes very public uh, quickly. What's happened is in the last year, attackers have moved and there's, they've kind of moved to looking at the exfiltration only method, which is about stealing uh, sensitive data. Um, so basically as a lot of the criminals that are in countries were, let's say uh, they're under sanctions or under you know, high scrutiny right now, they have basically went into this affiliate model as well and using exfiltration as their primary because it's also a way to stay more stealthy and it, you know, it's, it's less public visibility when those attacks happen. Uh, and we've also seen the ransomware uh, uh, code base has also change uh, to being things like Rust and Go based, which makes them more portable and also affect larger amounts of machines. So this is something, you know, there's lots of different types out there of ransomware, um, but it's constantly evolving. It's attacking more systems um, and also starting to become a lot more stealthy as well. Now, the attack techniques is commonly used by the attackers. These are the ways that attackers uh, look to get into the organizations. Usually the entry point typically is through some type of uh, vulnerability, um, either misconfiguration. It could be through remote desktop protocol or RDP or remote access. It could also be via phishing. Phishing has been one of the kind of most common methods, typically getting employees to hand over the credentials or to go to a site which is basically being compromised or to go to a fake site and enter the credentials and ultimately you know, getting the credentials stolen. And we've seen that recently, of course, uh, in the US, the, the large uh, public uh, incident with the likes of MGM Resort um, and also Caesars Palace where both of those uh, uh, casinos um, had become victims of ransomware. If you look at the MGM Resorts, Ultimately, it was several million per day at loss of the business uh, during that incident, and it's still not fully back up to, to complete operations after some uh, several weeks. Once they get that initial foot in the door, it's basically living off the land. The attackers prefer to use you know, the, the tools that they find in the network in order to basically uh, elevate privileges, to create backdoors, in order to change configurations, to move around and discover the environment. Uh, so they prefer to live off the land not introducing anything new, um, then they want to make sure that the access they have is persistent, that they can come back uh, whenever they want to. And sometimes they use techniques such as what we refer to as sticky keys or they create hidden users in the background because sometimes they're afraid that the user they might have compromised uh, might change the password or might change the security, locking them out. So they want to make sure they're able to come and go whenever they want to. Another area that they look is credential harvesting, which is very common. They want to get as many credentials as possible. Uh, once they get more credentials, they can let it remove around the network. And then they elevate up to full uh, domain or active directory um, access. Uh, this typically means usually when they get the directory access, it tends to be only a few hours before the attackers basically deploy um, something like a ransomware um, or a very destructive malware. So this tends to be the kind of most common uh, technique that's used and, and uh, the path that they uh, heavily utilize. The entry point does change depending on the victim, uh, but today most commonly it's social engineering and phishing is the predominantly method of gaining access. Now, when the attack happens, um, what typically is that you typically find out from external sources. So the most common ways that you'll find out you've, you've become a victim is sometimes law enforcement will contact you they will be basically either taking down a command and control or they'll be investigating other cases. And in those other cases, they tend to find some evidence of other victims. 
Uh, sometimes it's your third parties, including customers, might find out when they're accessing your services and they're unable to access them. They will then notify you. Um, the attackers might contact you directly. Um, in the case that I'm going to go through today, in this particular incident, the attackers contacted the IT team and the security team. They had all the details. They had their home addresses. They had their email addresses. They had their telephone numbers. And they contacted them uh, through lots of different methods to notify them that they had become victims. So that's one of the things, you know, the attackers want to make sure that they're actually reaching out and, and accelerating uh, the ransom payment as quickly as possible. So in most cases, they will contact the IT team and notify them. You might find out through social media, the attackers might be bragging about it. They might be um, you know, sending it out and, and, and just really kind of trying to make as much visibility and pressure on the organization as possible. You might find out from employees who are connecting to their systems and finding out that they've got basically uh, messages displayed on their devices and that the system's been compromised or been uh, encrypted. Or you might find out from security researchers. Now, just to give you one example, um, in this case, I mentioned the attackers contacted the, the organization directly. Um, during the investigation on this incident, um, myself as a security researcher, um, I did find uh, evidence of another victim within the actually logs and the evidence that I was researching and investigating. So I got permission to reach out proactively and contact this really large organization, a uh, really well-known organization. So I contacted them and said, uh, during an investigation of another incident, I found evidence that you've also become a victim. Uh, maybe we can work together and share indicators of compromise. And immediately afterwards, I got a response back saying, no, you're wrong. We were not a victim. Um, and uh, that was it, last communication that I received at that point. So later, I, of course, continued the investigation. Actually, I sent another message back saying, maybe you just haven't become a victim yet. Maybe we can prevent it from happening. Um, maybe you know we can go through and, and see if there's evidence that the attackers are already on their network. Um, and no response came after that. So about two months later, after doing this complete investigation, digital forensics and its response, uh, it came to the point where I needed to hand over all the evidence that I gathered uh, to law enforcement and the legal team. And during that handover, I want to make sure that I notified the other victim that said they weren't the victim, uh, that I'm now passing over the data, which included um, their server names, usernames, IP addresses, domain names, passwords, hashes to law enforcement. Uh, so I sent out just letting them know that uh, this was happening. And then immediately afterwards, they responded and said, yes, they were a victim. So it wasn't until I actually had the handover data that had evidence uh, that they had finally admitted. And even to date, uh, you will not find any evidence uh, publicly that they were a victim of uh, this particular ransomware case. Uh, so it's usually sometimes there's different means of finding out uh, that the organizations have become victims. Now, when organizations become a victim, that are immediately going to trigger an incident response plan. This is one of the most common techniques. Our organizations tend to all have a plan today in different types of incidents. And your plan might look something similar to this. You might have some defined uh, ownership of who's responsible for certain things. You might have a method of communications um, about who to contact, um, who needs to be responsible for doing what, who to involve, and it might be internal, external capabilities. You'll have that updated contact list, and I hope it's updated. Uh, a lot of incidents that I find that I'm working on, sometimes that contact list is, you know, a year or two old, and the people on that list is no longer, sometimes even with the company. Now, in different types of incidents, you might respond differently. You might go through some type of confidentiality or data loss. You might be dealing with a data poisoning or integrity attack or availability such as DDoS attack. Now, when we're talking about ransomware, ransomware checks all of those boxes. You're dealing typically with exfiltration, so you're dealing with a data loss. The attackers have extracted data out and are threatening to publicly disclose it. You're dealing with a data integrity issue, which means that the data has been encrypted, meaning that uh, that data is no longer available to you. And also you're dealing with an availability. And because of that encryption, you tend to be having a down, uh, basically a service as unavailable. So ransomware tends to impact all of those. So in the insurance response checklist, you might be going through your in-house capabilities, what your internal team has the ability to do, and you might also have third party, maybe in response teams or security teams that can assist you. Um, it's definitely better to have those already out front and planned and agreed rather than trying to do it in a mid-incident. 
you might be going through a containment process or evidence, evidence gathering. You might already have predefined press statements. You might have already uh, legal assessments into what types of regulatory compliance you might have to deal with. If you're in GDPR, you might have to contact the Data Protection Authority to notify uh, within 72 hours. You want to look at eradication, how your recovery plan is, and then you continually learn from the lessons from this. Unfortunately, all too often, when I'm involved in this response, that the incident response checklist and plan is also encrypted because it's sitting on SharePoint, it's sitting on a document or a PDF on the system that's encrypted. So it's always make sure that you have something like this that's already basically easily available, uh, you know, either a printed hard copy um, or on a device that's maybe not connected to the network. Um, so make sure you've got basically systems that are offline. Uh, that you can go to that have all the emergency uh, information that you need. Of course, once you get into this, uh, one thing I do want to mention about that is there's a very big difference between having a plan but also being prepared. Some of the things that you go through in an instant response is you want to have proper plans and actions. What's your mandatory requirements of who to contact, uh, who's involved, what's the meeting plans, how frequently they are. Who's going to respond to and uh, start communicating with the attackers? Um, who's the executive summary? Um, how is it made available? What type of information is in there? Documenting and having detailed incident response timeline about when the first time you find out, what uh, everything that happened and actions that occurred after that, um, and having making sure you've got that really, really kind of detailed uh, timeline. What's the attack path? Mapping it to the MITRE attack framework and understanding about all the different techniques that was used by the attackers. Um, doing a malware analysis of the ransomware itself um, is something that I was involved in and doing basically reverse engineering and understanding the, the techniques and capabilities of the ransomware. Um, what's your data recovery and evidence store process? Um, how are we going to recover the data? And ultimately, how are we basically you're going to collect the evidence and make it available to uh, the team at a later stage? Maybe doing threat intelligence, so looking through the dark web for any chatter or any uh, bragging or potential uh, disclosure of data or your data might be up for sale. Um, you know, understanding what, sec what security was in place and also, you know, why those security didn't actually prevent the attack and then look at mitigations that will help you contain the incident. Um, how did the data exfiltration occur? So ultimately, how did the attackers get the data out of your organization? And ultimately, making sure that you can actually uh, track and see exactly what type of data was extracted. Um, and that will also let you understand about what type of regulatory or potential compliance failure you might be dealing with. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, it's really important to have a very, very solid asset inventory uh, information so you know exactly what, you know, what systems you have and what applications, what data is out there. And then looking in the detail about the network activity. The lessons from this particular incident is that the organization, they had a plan. They had basically went through and they you know, had a good detailed plan. But the problem was during this incident, this ransomware case, is that they never practiced it. They never simulated it. They never went through and actually understood what it would be like to be in that real life scenario. So there's always a difference between having a solid plan, but also having a simulated plan. And that can make a big difference. When you go through a simulated plan, it allows you to start understanding about some areas of gap, um, such as, for example, this organization was a multinational organization and they had different basically time zones and different, uh, for example, time formats that they had to deal with. And when you're collecting evidence, you want to make sure what time zone are you actually going to use as the base time zone, what naming convention you're going to use for basically uh, you know, collecting the uh, images of affected systems. Also, what policies apply? Do you have actually documented policies that actually uh, oversee uh, when you're dealing with uh, ransomware and uh, uh, security incidents? So, you know, who from HR has been involved previously? Have you dealt with legal about whether you want to communicate with the attackers? What it means for you, you know, in regards to re regulatory compliance, who you need to notify? And also, do you have contacts with law enforcement? Um, which can also make a big difference because sometimes law enforcement might already be dealing with other cases uh, that can actually maybe help you look at indicators, compromise, or methods that help them. In some cases, even law enforcement might have already you know, been able to get a decryption key. Uh, so sometimes that can accelerate things as well. How are you going to uh, do evidence gathering? How are you going to get the logs and images? Uh, this particular uh, victim, um, what ha ended up happening was they didn't have enough disk space to put all the images. So we ended up having to do basically same day delivery of massive orders of basically hard disks from Amazon. 
uh, in order to be able to have enough disk space in order to put the images. And it typically is equal to your existing storage capabilities uh, at that date. Um, so, you know, terabytes of, of, of hard disks were being ordered in order to be able to do the evidence gathering. Um, and, you know, that's a big problem because, you know, those disks need to go through sanitization, they need to get cleaned, they make sure they're formatted as a right, actually, uh, file system. So that creates lots of challenges as well. How the, the, the forensics and its response teams, are, what identities and user access do they need in order to gather? Because if you're going to be using the same Active Directory accounts that have already been compromised, you're going to be contaminating evidence. Uh, what about uh, service accounts? How are you going to rotate those? Even having a go bag makes a big difference. You know, having a bag that's ready to go that basically has all your equipment. Um, even you know, if you're going to be working in a data center, you want to be warm. Uh, where you're going to be sleeping at night, having a sleeping bag, having ch some chocolate bars just to give you energy to get you through the day. Because this is one of the most stressful times for an organization is dealing with ransomware. Autobahn communications. One of the things is that the attackers will have access to your entire environment. So how do you, can you communicate without them seeing? your communications as well. Now, they'll have access to emails, they'll have access to your communications, messaging apps, and so forth. Um, so it's really important to have an alternative out-of-band communications that is um, not gonna be you know, uh, compromised through the same credentials. Help desk team being ready and able to you know, respond to concerned victims, you know, your customers and partners, employees. Um, keep that incident response plan updated, but go through these practice drills. It's so critical, um, and I can't tell you how, how important time is during this whole process. Um, the first 24 hours is probably the most important um, of an organization during a ransomware attack. So make sure that you're practicing ready and you basically go through this as quickly as you can. The particular ransomware I'm gonna to refer to in uh, today's uh, example is Crylock. Uh, Crylock is a uh, variant that basically was known as Cryacle um, up until about 1.6. Um, uh, law enforcement did get uh, find decryption keys for the 1.6 of Cryacle, uh, but in Crylock 2.0, it had a much improved uh, encryption capability, uh, which was uh, you know definitely much better than previous variants. And also, it was one of the first ones th that I dealt with that basically was a ransomware as a service. So the creators of this particular ransomware are not the same who deploy it. Um, so it's really important as they went through basically an affiliation or distribution program, uh, signing up their, their channel partners in order to use this. As you can see here, this is typically what you see. You'll get, you've got four days, your data will be permanently deleted. And if you pay within uh, two days, you get a 50% discount. Just to give you some of the figures here, the ransom demand was in the tens of millions of euros. Um, and that 50% discount, you know, <laughs> was still a lot of money. Um, and time is essential here to responding. Um, so during the investigation, of course, uh, there is negotiators who do reach out. And uh, what's really important here to kind of the act and, you know, uh, to work because ultimately the attackers in this case are going to, you're basically, you know, uh, the, you're in the wrong because you didn't stop them from gaining access. So they will treat you as, a, as, a, as a, you know, as the malicious person, as the, the person who basically allowed this to happen. Uh, and it's a very tough time uh, for the organization. Going through, here's an example of basically doing some dynamic analysis of the uh, executable, the, the ransomware from executing. So some of the things I do here is I'll, create, for example, large files of different character sets to see maybe what types of encryptions used. Um, you'll basically see here, this is the temporary folder location. I've got Process Explorer running, and basically also got uh, Regmon uh, running in the background here. So as we go through, well, let's kind of take a look. So you'll see here that the ransomware gets executed. Of course, the prompt here uh, will not be displayed in the real scenario, but uh, just in this demonstration, it does get displayed. Uh, once it executes, what you'll see here is that basically at the bottom of Process Explorer, it will actually launch a child process. It will do a ping back up into a command and control. So it's communicating externally to notify that there's another victim um, in, you know, basically who's now basically you know, uh, been compromised a ransomware. Of course, during the scenario that won't display, it'll be auto accepted. Um, it, it deletes then the parent process and deletes the original uh, executable. And then it creates a child process within the temporary uh, location of this machine. And then within only a few minutes, basically this entire system of gigs uh, of data uh, gets encrypted. Um, so I'll kind of scroll through and you can see here eventually uh, towards the end, you can see basically in this folder in the desktop, you can see there's different types of character sets and file sizes. 
and ultimately uh, once this ransomware is finished it changes the extension of those files and then there's a HDA uh, basically which is a prompt that gets displayed in the background here um, that really uh, shows that this system is encrypted um, and then all the files are unaccessible. So this is what it's like to, you know, for a, a employee who ultimately sees their machine uh, when they log in, none of their files on the systems or applications. The system itself, the operating system still functions, but ultimately uh, all the data and applications will not be able to access the data. So one of the most important things here for, you know, a, a victim is you want to know what you're dealing with. You want to know what type of variant. Now, the attackers in this particular case, they actually had five different types of ransomware variants. There was five different types of ransomware variants um, were determined, basically, they decided which one would avoid the security controls that they had in place. So one of the things here you want to find out quickly is a sample of the cryptor. You want to understand what capabilities it has. So finding that, basically, uh, that, uh, sample, one method you can do is upload it to uh, solutions like uh, Joe Sandbox, uh, which does basically dynamic analysis of the, uh, the ransom or the crypto itself. It allows you to get a good idea of what types of capabilities it has. Does it have the command and control? Does it do basically credential theft? Does it basically have a Trojan? Does it, is it a worm that moves around the network by itself? So you want to understand about what uh, you're dealing with, and Joe Sandbox is a great way of being able to see, um, and maybe other victims might have already uploaded the, similar, the same variant that you're dealing with, um, to understand some of those uh, other victims' uh, indicators of compromise and some of the techniques that was used. You also might want to upload it to VirusTotal. Uh, VirusTotal will give you an understanding about, for example, what types of security uh, alerts or what has been seen before. Now, this is uh, uploaded here, it was months later, but on the first instance, uh, when the ransomware the first time, only three AVs were detecting this particular variant of ransomware, uh, meaning that the three AVs uh, if you weren't running any of those, uh, even your antivirus or endpoint detection uh, would have not stopped this ransomware from running. Uh, so something to be aware of is that when the attackers have access to your systems, they will try to understand about what types of security controls you already have in place. And when they find out what security controls you've got in place, they will use techniques that try to avoid detection. And also techniques that will you know, make sure that your security products are not going to stop them. So next thing here, one of the things I always ask the question is what did the attackers have access to and what was the techniques they used in order to basically move around? So I want to understand, did they get access to the domain administrators? Did they get access to domain controllers? Did they have access to what systems uh, and what were those systems functions? Uh, what data did they get access to? What applications? Um, was it just on-premise or in the cloud? How long was the attack going on for? What tools did they use? Uh, did they leave any back doors or ways to gain persistence? Uh, so ultimately you want to make sure you close those. What data did they take and how did they extract it? What was the timelines of events? And ultimately what evidence was remaining? These are some of the things I go in and try to gather this in order to answer some of these important questions to make sure the organization one is can you know, find a way to recover, but also make sure the attackers have no way to get back in at a later stage. The organization is then faced with a massive decision um, because the attackers still have active access. They still have access to the network. They still have access to the credentials. So the organization is going to come to basically a massive decision whether they basically pull the plug to their actually uh, operations. Um, what can they go back to manual? Uh, what can still be operational? Uh, so these are some of the most important decisions. This organization, this victim, um, ultimately decided to basically pull the plug to their internet access and go back to manual operations. Um, is one of the things that they decided to do because the attackers were still in the process of trying to exfiltrate the data. They had extracted about 40 gigs of a almost 200 gig database and uh, it was decided that uh, to make sure that that data was not being uh, stolen and, and, and exfiltrated. So they decided to make sure and uh, disconnect their systems from the internet and then work on uh, eradication, work on the evidence gathering. And this is what happens and you see this time and time again many organizations are faced with this hard decision into what to do with their business. And this means that their business is basically has stopped at this point. Now, after becoming a victim, you tend to have only a few decisions to make. Um, you want to restore from a backup. That's the ideal scenario. You want to, you know, some organizations consider paying the ransom uh, and some basically, you know, try to rebuild from scratch. Now I go through and, you know, in this particular victim, um, I asked, 
well, what kind of what backup uh, options do we have? And unfortunately, their backup was also encrypted. Even just a few weeks ago, I was uh, talking to another organization who were also victim, and they had three backups. They had the backup, they had a backup of the backup, and they also had the secret backup. And the attackers found all of them uh, on the network and encrypted all of them. So it's really important to make sure that you know you have a ransomware resilient backup. That's one of the things I highly recommend going through. Um, and this particular, this victim was considering paying the ransom and was looking for alternatives. Um, the one that I mentioned just a few weeks ago, they did negotiation and ultimately paid 50% of the ransom demand. Um, so sometimes, you know, you get into organizations who consider paying the ransom itself. Um, my recommendation is, you know, I, I like to look for all possibilities of not paying the ransom, but ultimately I only recommend against it. Uh, but it ultimately it is a business decision. Uh, that the business had to decide, you know, how to get back to operations. So this particular victim now going through, one of the things that they were fortunate enough is a one year prior to this ransomware case. So they basically, they're facing, you know, their business is completely destroyed. Um, when you talk about that, they had no information about employee contracts. They had no information about logistics information, uh, the invoices that they sent out, who to pay, their financial details, their ERP system, their inventory system, um, all of that gone. Uh, you know, you know what, what employees' performance reviews were, what's, you know, what's their salaries, what's their job descriptions, all of that completely gone. Um, and they were faced basically with you know, what to do. When doing the investigation and doing the asset inventory portion, they were fortunate enough to find a system that had basically, uh, it was done a migration one year prior. That migration basically uh, was a hardware migration because the hardware was not uh, new enough in order to support a new version, so they did a hardware upgrade. Lucky enough that one system was still available sitting collecting dust under a desk. Uh, so during the asset inventory, we find this one system that actually literally had a uh, footprint, a uh, baseline of their entire environment from one year prior. Um, so it did mean that they had this one system that they were able to use in order to actually start a recovery, which meant that they had lost one year's worth of the entire business operations. Um, and that process then went into going and scraping drives and getting through emails and trying to recover. Also, they were fortunate enough that they'd just previously done a cloud uh, uh, deployment um, and the only one that was affected for their environment was the on-premise. So their cloud was, uh, environment was still available and still operational. Uh, so they're able to use that in order to, to start working on a recovery uh, capabilities. But it did mean that they were severely impacted uh, from this. So let's get into, I'm going to take you through this live demonstration um, and do a complete walkthrough into what it looks from the attacker perspective. Um, and I will go through and, and share exactly uh, all the steps and techniques was done. Uh, so just bear with me while I switch over to my demo environment. Okay, so I hope you're seeing this still. So if just give me, Tracy, can you give me confirmation that this is now uh, being sh shown? Yes, we can see it. Okay, fantastic. So one of the most common methods, as I mentioned earlier, is using the you know phishing and compromised credentials techniques. Uh, one of the things is that you know for many users and many employees out there, um, even contractors, and and, and uh, uh, we tend to use easy guessable passwords, and we tend to reuse those passwords commonly. So one of the most common techniques for attackers is to basically try and get a copy of the basically password hash. The password hash is an encrypted format of the clear text password. And when the attacker ultimately kind of gets a good understanding about what your password kind of history is, um, they can quickly search for many previously you know, disclosed uh, database dumps out there that contains all your previous password choices. And if you've got a combination that is a, you know, it is a simple variations of that, the attackers will be able to create really smart, intelligent word lists that they can go through basically and crack those passwords. So you can see here, the big boss here on the system has this uh, encrypted basically format of the hash, uh, which is, this is the hash itself. And it's the encrypted uh, one way direction hash um, of the password itself. So this is what systems use in order to basically exchange and ensure that you can authenticate correctly. Now the attacker is using tools such as Hashcat, and once they know what type of hash this is, they can basically say, here's the hash, which is this file, 
Uh, here's a, a very intelligent word list of all of this user's previously known uh, compromised passwords. And I just disabled the, the pot file from basically running this before. So simply running this, and ultimately after even only a few seconds here, you can see that the attacker has been able to successfully uh, get the clear text password for this person. Um, so that's basically, you know, with you know, choosing weak credentials or weak passwords, this is one of the most common methods that attackers are able to continually successfully gain access. And then once they've got the clear text password, they can simply uh, become uh, that person and pretend to be that person and, and log on with those credentials. Now, how do the attackers also, you know, sometimes they get those hashes, uh, sometimes they even just get the clear text password by basically having pretexting or asking people for it um, or just creating websites that, you know, uh, are fake that look like the sites that you're going to. Another common method, <coughs> excuse me, is using tools like Responder here. So Responder <laughs> basically will um, mean that any machine that's on the same network, and this can also be done over uh, web and email, and uh, those machines will try to connect to my machine. So I'm simply just gonna run Responder here, and this will take advantage of what we know, call as LMNR. So over here, I've got two victim machines. I've got this rogue victim, which is this machine here, and I've also got a domain controller. And I'm gonna take you through the steps that ultimately the attacker will do in order to physically compromise both of those. So first of all, let's log in. And what we can do then, just one second while it logs in, I'm going to simulate what it looks like for responder to work. So if the user basically gets, let's say, they simply just get an email and they click on that link or they go to the website and they click on that, uh, it will basically uh, send the attacker um, the encrypted format of the password. So I can simply go here and uh, just basically by doing that, I haven't put any credentials in, I haven't done anything else. But what this action has done is uh, that my machine has responded and said, that network shard that you're looking to gain access to is over here. You can gain access to it from this system. So if I go back here, you can see that that victim machine has simply shared its network NTLM hash with the attacker's machine. And now, now that I have this hash, I can simply take that hash, again, bring it over here, put it into a file. So this is the hash of that uh, victim. Again, using hashcat and the mode and the hash itself and simply running this and after only a couple of minutes of basically running through on this machine, you can see here, I've been able to crack the password and clear text. Now for this particular scenario in the demo here, I have changed the passwords from the real passwords that's been used, um, just from non-disclosure and stuff like that. Uh, but just to let you know that the passwords in the victim's environment were easy guessable. They were passwords that were created by humans. They chose easy guessable passwords and the attackers were able to go through the same techniques that I'm showing you in order to compromise those passwords. So that's one of the most common techniques is being able to crack the passwords. And that's why it's really important to make sure that you choose wise passwords um, that, you know, typically the longer the better. Um, short passwords, anything less than, you know, 16, 15 characters, even with special characters, uh, tends to be easily uh, crackable. So now the next section is one other common method in order to get access that initial foothold is through brute force attacks. Um, so in this particular environment, uh, there was a machine that was publicly facing, which had remote desktop protocol running on it. And the attackers were able to find that using tools like Shodan, and that machine becomes available and visible. And again, they can you know, do enough reconnaissance and offer information about who this uh, person that uses this machine is. So Crowbar here, using this command, I'm targeting RDP. I've got the IP address of that public facing RDP machine. Here's the basically user of that system. Here's the well-crafted word list. And in this case, I'm using 100 threads, so it's gonna do 100 simultaneously RDP brute forces of the system. So again, you know, having a really good you know, chosen word list, uh, again, it will be only a matter of time before the attacker is able to find the successful password that will work on this machine uh, and basically ultimately give them access. Um, other methods as well is you know, through you know, uh, phishing and um, and, you know, basically getting the employee to log on to fake sites also, which is quite common as well. So I'll just wait for this to go into the brute force. So as you can see here, again, RDP was successful and the attacker now has the ability in order to gain access. So the next stage that the attacker will do is log on as that user. So they're going to do our remote desktop with the user against that uh, RDP system. They'll log on. 
and basically ultimately for you know the victim here all they will see is basically uh, somebody successfully logging on with that uh, person's credentials now to give you some background into who was this initial victim so this initial victim was actually an accountant so the accountant um, it was the end of the quarter the accountant needed to do some financial transactions um, they weren't able to travel so what they did was they contacted the uh, hosting provider the isp and they demanded remote access to the uh, the financial server um, and since the accountant is has some power uh, they were threatening enough and, and demanding enough that the hosting provider ultimately enabled rdp access uh, for this particular system to the public internet and the uh, accountant was able to log on now interestingly just to go here through this machine is in the exact same state that that accountant had. Um, now, I'm gonna take you through some of the findings of that machine, which was quite shocking. Um, on the desktop, uh, there was a file labeled exactly as it is here called important stuff. So this accountant basically had a file said important stuff. And when you open that file, they have basically had the IP addresses, the server information, the administrator password, they had the database information, they had financial websites along with the, the passwords in clear tax sitting in a clear text password sitting on the desktop of this machine. Now, you know, I know that this is shocking, but this is such a common thing that basically employees do is they, they try to make their lives easy by putting things in easy, accessible places. And the attackers, when they log in with that compromised user, they will also look for those types of things as well. Now, the next thing the attackers will do is they'll log in and they'll take a look at the browser. Now, one great thing is the browsers have lots of really great security. Uh, but unfortunately, lots of browsers don't have security by default. So the attacker can simply go to passwords in the browser and simply here they can find all of the accounts that this person's used, things like Expensify, email, Office 365, and they can simply just go and show that password in clear text again. So these are some of the most common techniques and they will, you know, doing that credential, uh, basically discovery. They'll be looking for other passwords that allow them to get access to other parts of the network and environment. So this is another method. Um, so yes, some people recommend throwing your password in the browser for ease of use. But again, you have to remember that if you don't enable security, the attackers, if they ever compromise, will also have access to those credentials as well. So the next stage is they want to do some enumeration. So what they'll end up doing is they'll open up a command prompt. They'll go through and say, who am I? I'm Neo in the matrix. What's my host name? Um, okay, I'm on Rogue. And I'll also look at uh, that local group. And they want to see basically what permissions you have in the system. Now, mistake, the next mistake that uh, was made on this particular system was that this user was a member of the local administrator group. And this is a massive no-no. This is a massive mistake. Attackers really want to find where these types of mistakes are done. So now what they're able to do is as a local administrator in the system, they can make configuration changes. So right now they don't own the network. They only own this machine. But the big mistake here of giving local minister rights means the attacker can make configuration changes to this. They can really get to the point where they can go simply and go open up and they can disable security on the machine. Um, the next thing what they'll end up doing is also is they'll download their payloads. So I'm going to do that here. So I'm going to basically on this system here, here's all the different payloads. And this is the exact naming convention of the attackers here. Uh, A.zip A was an auto uh, scripting tools. B.zip was the payloads. Um, C was, for example, different types of ransomware variants. Uh, scanner was a scanning tool. And Zap was basically the ability to, in order to launch and deploy the attack itself. So simply by launching up a web server here, uh, what the attacker can now do um, on this victim machine is they can simply open up the browser. go to the machine location. Let me put in the right address here. And now what they can do is basically download those different payloads. So they'll download the payloads. So now they can go into, for example, wherever they download the payloads. Um, in most cases, where they tend to place it is in places like movies, documents, pictures, you know, um, in a temporary location. So they try to hide their uh, tools in plain sight. Now in here, you'll see uh, what they've got is they've got this auto folder. 
um, and going into the auto folder, um, in this location here, you'll see different automation scripts. So um, one is disable security. So this is basically an automation uh, script that will go and disable security in the system. I can show you, these are the real scripts the attackers actually use. So edit here, and this is the script that will go through and now I disable all security on this machine, allowing the attacker to work and do their malicious activity without actually you know, being monitored and you know, uh, anything uh, raising alarms. So this will disable security. What they can do is go and launch a, you know, find passwords. The downloader will download the malicious tools and payloads. Um, they might create a new user. Uh, so in the background here, uh, they might want to go and create a, a user that they can actually gain persistence. Or they might go and enable sticky keys here. Sticky keys will allow the attacker in order basically to simply access this machine at a later stage without having to know the password. So after going through and doing these uh, tools, the next stage what they'll do is they'll go and run a tool such as Mimikatz. Now in later versions of Windows, uh, the uh, storing passwords in clear text and memory has basically you know, been uh, uh, patched and stopped. Uh, but with these simple changes of the script itself, this will revert those changes so that the password will be stored in clear text. The attacker will then go and run a script called dump creds. This is exactly the same script the attacker has used. And this basically by running this script will then dump all of the clear text passwords from memory into this file here. Now, of course, the first time the attacker will run this, they're only gonna get the credentials off the user that's currently logged on. So they'll be able to get the current user, which is Neo, and they'll be able to see the password, of course, for Neo. Now, what the attacker will want to do is find a way to lure um, other users in the environment that has higher level privileges. Uh, so in this case, where they might want to, they might break some things in this machine, cause some disk problems, they might, uh, you know, cause some application failures, alarms. Uh, once they make those uh, changes, they'll go back up into the auto script and they'll run this clean script. The clean script will actually clean up the machine from all of the evidence that, you know, has been, uh, you know, basically created during this particular session. The sessions typically last between four and eight minutes long, no longer because they know, the attacker knows that a lot of the services that they've actually stopped working will actually be auto-protected and restarted within a 30 minute window. So therefore, once those services start back, so the attacker tries not to be longer uh, than that to make sure they can stay hidden. So if you come back and you investigate this machine with problems, the only thing you'll ever find is a small gap in the logs and nothing else. And the security will scan the machine and nothing will be detected. So the attackers are really good at staying stealthy and you know they know the timing, they know what they can do without raising any you know typical alarms. So in this particular machine, one of the important things was that there was a backup job running. Um, and that backup job was running TS exec, which we connected this machine on a daily basis, you know, usually midnight or 2 a.m. in the morning. It'll take a backup of the database, and then basically that machine has been you know backed up. Unfortunately, the actually credentials that was used for that basically uh, backup job was the main credentials. So now the attacker, after running this over a few days, they can simply come back into this machine and after basically that backup job runs and after making those configuration changes uh, that's hidden uh, to the user, uh, they now can find actually the password of the domain administrator basically here in clear text along with the hashes. So this is the next mistake is using a backup job running with the domain credentials um, in order to basically access the machine because now the attacker can basically you know steal those credentials and reuse them so another interesting thing here was uh, gmer gmer is a tool that we typically use in the security industry in order to find you know rootkits and backdoors uh, the attackers were actually using gmer in this case in order to find security uh, solutions that were hidden behind the scenes so they're using it you know in order to find what security is running on the machine itself so an interesting mechanism. The next thing that typically the attacker will then do is they'll go and run a scanner. Now, interestingly, the scanner they used in this particular instance was actually uh, you know, a commercial software. Um, so they go through and they'll start scanning. And unfortunately, the next mistake that this organization made was they made all of the system's names easy guess, easily to understandable what those systems were, like ERP system, CRM system, uh, database, backup, so by naming them uh, in basically a simple way of knowing what their task is, made the attackers also very easily know what they can do. So now they can see all these systems. Systems here, 
domain controller, for example, they also use this tool, uh, for example, in order to run automation. So you can see here, create a new user, download packages, turn security off, put sticky keys in this machine. So they're not able to use this tool in order to basically deploy and create other staging machines in the environments. Um, uh, so this is an, a method that we're able to use in order to scan and find out where all of the sensitive systems were. So we can go ahead and force this to close. We don't need it anymore once the scan is done. The next stage the detector will then do is they'll basically log on to the domain controller and validate that they have full access. So now basically logged in with the domain controller credentials. The attacker will then maybe go and they'll look through and they'll have access to all of the accounts here. They might find one, they might decide to basically reset the password. So this particular one, they might say, if they do a discovery and they might look at when's the last time this user logged on, maybe they're on vacation, maybe it's a dormant account, they will go and reset the password. So again, they can come back at a later stage and then log into the domain controller. Unfortunately, at this point in time, after this action occurs, it tends to be somewhere between four and eight hours before the attacker will then go and launch basically the attack. Uh, so once they've had access to domain controller, they can come back out, and they can go into this system and they basically have the automation script to launch the attack. And th what this will then do is basically in all the systems in the environment, it will then take that piece of ransomware, put it on the system and execute it. And then the entire environment basically becomes infected and unavailable to the entire organization. So these are some of the most common steps. Now, after going through, just to show you some of those backdoors that the user created, what that I can then do is close this down and I can go basically here, uh, for example, uh, to PSExec. So I can run PSExec and log directly into that victim machine using the command line. So the same tools that was used to run the backup job uh, for the database. So you can see here, if I do host name, I'm on the victim machine. Who am I? I'm uh, anti-authority system. So I have now full access to this machine. Also, after going through and getting the actually uh, hash, so you can see here, uh, on this particular one, I'm going to access the domain controller with the administrator account. And I don't even need to know the password. Um, I simply just need to get the hash of that uh, password. And I can actually do pass the hash and it'll all go into that system. So here you can see I actually own the domain controller and I'm basically uh, in, uh, the matrix and the domain. So I completely at this point, after doing those simple steps of going through, I own this entire network. I can do whatever I want. I can actually trade the data to wherever I want to, and I completely can do whatever damage at this point. Now, I mentioned earlier about sticky keys. One of the things that the attackers used in this case was sticky keys. So you can see here, I've got a login prompt. So if I remove desktop in, and let's say for whatever reason, the user changed their password, and I can no longer log in, Password is basically incorrect. You look at that password denied or access denied. So password is incorrect, try again. Now what the attacker can do is after doing sticky keys, they can simply click in here and you can see that the command prompt comes up, who am I, and I'm anti authority system. Now again, this is a, you know, antivirus will detect this, but it will only detect it if it's scanning at the same time that this is open. So the attackers know, again, timing, they will be able to go and create a new user very quickly uh, in order to, and basically once they've created that new user, they can hide that and then log in with that user. So they're able to know what techniques they hid and what techniques will raise alarms. And they also know that time window that it wasn't to go and do this malicious activity uh, where possible. So going back to the slides here, kind of some of the uh, techniques uh, that can help actually reduce the risks. So. So what things, what things can you do in order to basically make these, you know, attack type of attacks and ransomware attacks uh, less successful? So this is going into some of my top tips that I recommend that if these were in case uh, in place, they, they would have at least prevented or, or slowed the attacker down or raised a lot more visibility. Uh, but good education and cyber hygiene. Make sure that one is that users are choosing smart passphrases, which are long and also using, you know, definitely multi-factor authentication as well. 
uh, make sure that you know multi-factor authentication would have actually made it more difficult for the attackers. It wouldn't have made it impossible, but it would have forced them to do more higher risk and more social engineering to gain access. But really good knowledge and what a good password is um, and, and make, make sure that it's long and, and, and use a password manager where possible. Having a backup and test plan, which is basically resilient against ransomware attacks. And this means definitely having an offline backup. There's lots of cases where was seen in the postal services where you've got victims of ransomware attacks, which even took out you know, the ability for them to operate, especially at very uh, critical times, such as the holiday periods, uh, you know, Christmas time, or when people are ordering presents or you know, doing deliveries and packages. Um, we've seen times where basically a lot of those uh, services have been flooded and unable to operate. Um, so having a good backup and test plan and simulating that backup and making sure it's recoverable uh, is critical as well. So this is another area, and I can't emphasize enough of having a, a ransom or resilient backup, which is important as well. Um, as also, a, as I mentioned, multi-factor authentication, having a phishing resilient MFA is also important. So making sure that you go through and put the right security controls that makes it as difficult as possible. The next one is zero trust and least privilege. Um, what I showed you in the, the demo uh, today is where the attackers were able to um, you know, gain access to a local administrator account. And then the backup job is running under a domain administrator account. So this is really where you get into uh, making sure that you know, you're know you doing least privilege. So make sure that the users don't have local administrator rights because attackers know that they will elevate quickly up to those credentials. Um, and where you're using backup jobs, make sure you're using dedicated uh, credentials which don't give the attackers a full access even if they do compromise it. User privilege account, access our account management solution that will help you rotate credentials after usage, uh, make it more difficult for attackers to, you know, even if they're able to get the password and clear attacks or even the hash, it prevents the ability for them to do lateral moves. Implementing solutions like application control will also make it difficult for the attacker to use any malicious applications or use even uh, tools like PSExec, which can be used for both good and bad, but making sure that there's legitimate reasons and uh, times that those applications can be executed. And again, you know, making sure you have a good patch and, and, and uh, updating your security on a frequent basis. Ultimately, the goal here is to reduce the risk, is to make it as difficult as possible. So some ransomware resource that I highly recommend, uh, a good tool is also, which is basically, uh, this is uh, the Flare, which is uh, a basically a instant response uh, virtual environment in order to make sure you're able to collect evidence then you've got the SAN SIFT, which is another tool which is great for basically doing instant response and forensics. Um, a good resource and website is the nomoreransom.org, which has got lots of uh, ransomware resources, uh, which are great and you know provide some best practices and, uh, and some basically uh, advice on what things you can put in place. There also is the CISA.gov, which is the stop ransomware site and also gives lots of good resources and information. And then some of the resources that I've created myself uh, directly, which are available for Delinea, uh, we've got different ransomware surveys and research that we've done. We've done guide to securing Windows uh, endpoints. We've got instant response checklists um, and more details around cyber insurance as well. Uh, so those are some of the resources that I've created that helps uh, reduce the risk as well. So at that point, Tracy, I mean, if uh, James wants to add some more details, um, we can get kind of cover it or we can get into you know, answering some of the questions as well. Thank you very much, um, Joe. Yes, so um, I think we can move straight to, to James, but let me just say two things. One, uh, remind everyone that you can use the Q&A pod for questions, and Joe, there are some questions already in the pod, so that um, if possible, you can maybe answer them uh, in writing if you can, and I will read out the answers later, or we can do it in, um, verbally afterwards. Um, and just to remind everyone that this is the last day of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, so we caught it right on the head. So um, ensure that you are uh, well prepared for any potential risks, as Joe just mentioned, in your organization. And let's, let's not let this month be the end of awareness. Let's ensure it's, you keep aware all through the year in your organization. So I'll hand over to James, who will probably introduce himself. Um, James has a quite um, extensive background in this sphere, um, having taught in the, um, let's just say the, um, maybe James would 
do the, the, the necessary. He's taught in this space at the highest levels in terms of cyber defense. So James, over to you for adding some color to this and giving some best practices and some lessons learned. Over to Thanks, you. Tracy. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, that was great. I, I was I was watching Joe's presentation. I've seen a lot of them. Uh, that was special. Um, so uh, have me go first next time, Tracy. I don't want to follow this guy anymore. Um, anyway, folks, great to be here with you. So uh, yeah, my name's James. I'm a, I'm a cyber lawyer, a university professor. I work for the uh, United States government and uh, with the uh, private sector uh, domestically and internationally. So um, when, when Tracy first asked me to come on, uh, I did some research. Uh, and I looked at at some of your posts around the world, and um, you are in peril. And so what I did is I I, I want to frame my discussion today, and so I came up with uh, five specific rules uh, to uh, to help you. And so I'll reiterate these rules at the end of our discussion. Um, if you if you take what I tell you to heart, you will be uh, in a better position to defend yourself. You'll be uh, more resilient in the face of these uh, relentless aggressors. Um, and you'll be in the best possible position to lessen your liability. As, as Joe explained, ransomware is a crime of cyber extortion. So uh, they're obviating the, the confidentiality, the integrity, the availability of data. And the way, though, that the world is progressing, that, that ransomware is evolving, is it's more towards this uh, exfiltration of data, this, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 confidentiality, the obviation of confidentiality, and what that's doing, right? It's it's all ways to bully you, right? To make you pay up. Um, and uh, one of the things I wanted to do is, look, cyber extortion is a booming business, right? And uh, if we have time later on, I can get into uh, some of the more history, why it was that there was a dip uh, last year, but there was an increase this year. Um, but, you know, because we're a little pressed for time, what I want to do is just get to um, some of the uh, five rules that I have for you. So um, the first one I have is that cyber extortion gangs are not lone wolf actors. They are criminal business enterprises, criminal business enterprises. And to appreciate the extent to which you are vulnerable to attack, um, and hopefully therefore we take, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll take action spurred in your own self-interest, um, you need to understand the sophistication and capabilities of your adversaries. And so um, let's do a quick thought exercise. I'll ask you to do a couple thought exercises during our conversation this morning um, or afternoon where you are. Um, when, you, when you think of the term cyber criminal, what image comes to your mind? I would just take a second, please. Cyber criminal. Um, and I'll tell you the image that appears most often when I talk to United States audiences. Um, and that's because there's there's posters in government buildings, there's posters in private sector buildings, and basically what it is, it's it's some it's some like anonymous person um, in a hoodie uh, before a computer screen. And that really does, and the, the, they're solitary, right? It's It could be someone in their mother's basement. It's, it's um, and it really kind of does a disservice because it gives you this, this false um, belief that ransomware gangs, cyber extortion gangs are, are lone wolves. And nothing could be further from the truth. What should come to your mind to appreciate the danger that you're in is a criminal syndicate, a criminal syndicate uh, in the nature of a modern, sophisticated business. These gangs are not solitary. They have expert language and cultural skills, and they're methodical. They're methodical in their in their approach. They're ruthless. They want your money. They have zero qualms about hurting your post, your ability to transport goods. Um, and important too, I think, to keep in our minds is that these gangs are not static monoliths. They take whatever form is most advantageous to them. They disband. They reconstitute. They morph. In a word, they change. Some gangs have distributed networks. Uh, and some even operate ransomware as a service model, where affiliates are recruited to conduct attacks, resulting in a web of unconnected threat actors. And change is not limited to the composition of the gangs themselves, but also the characteristics of the victims. In 2020, for example, the majority of victims consisted of, 
um, government agencies and the private sector in mainly, mainly English speaking countries. And that's for two reasons. One, it's a target rich environment. Uh, and two, uh, the gangs had language and cultural skills uh, to prey upon English speaking victims. But that's changing now and puts many of you uh, in our audience today uh, squarely in the crosshairs. So, and this brings me to my second rule. <clears throat> Cyber extortion is a uh, crime facilitated by technology, but committed by people against people. Facilitated by technology, but committed by people against people. And that's because too often when, I, when I'm asked to come in and, uh, and um, talk to corporations that I have been hit, everyone has this preconceived inelastic conception that ransomware is, is just a crime of technology, that it's somehow a computer fighting a computer. And again, that's, that's, not, that's not reality. Cyber extortion is a crime that uses technology as a tool, but people are nonetheless at the heart of the crime. And on one level, that makes sense, right? You can see why people kind of get this kind of the, the wrong end of the wrong end of the horse here, because we're talking about data exfiltration, we're talking about CIA triad, we're talking about disruption, we're talking about threat actors from the other side of the world attacking your organization, all of which is reliant upon uh, technology. Uh, but there is the all-important human element in cyber extortion, which, in my humble opinion, receives scant attention, uh, but is nonetheless essential to understanding the fundamental characteristics of the crime. And as, as I kind of alluded to before, for example, Japan has not been attacked as much as its wealth and business density suggests because Attackers hitherto for have lacked the language skills and just as important the cultural understanding to exact the extortion schema. You know, Japan has the same hardware, software, operating system, vulnerabilities, you name it, as everyone else in the rest of the world. The differentiator has been that cyber extortion crime, again, is a, is a crime uh, by people against people. And so in certain areas of the world, there has been uh, a type of almost an inoculation against some of the worst effects of cyber extortion. Um, but this is changing, right? Similar to a, to a disease in, a, in the body where a virus will mutate because of a given drug, so too are these gangs evolving and infecting other parts of the world. The criminal must understand the victim's data and the value of its data, right? So, and the victim must understand their data and the value of their data, right? Hopefully before, before um, an attack occurs. Um, and the human element is also present in the all-important question of, do you pay or do you not pay? And so, and Joe alluded to this. I, th I think it's absolutely critical. This brings me to, to rule number three. Organizations must have real-world exercise plans prior to getting attacked. In other words, no paper tigers allowed, right? No paper tigers allowed. The answer to the question, do you pay or do you not pay, if done correctly, is fact and context dependent. And definitively, one that is best answered not in the cauldron. And some of you may have actually experienced this you know, in real time. And I think cauldron um, is, is the right word. And those of you who have gone through this searing experience won't soon forget it. Um, but the time to make those decisions is not in the maelstrom of, of when you are in an attack, but rather before when you're taking the time to understand your data and the value of your data. And what I respectfully suggest to all of you is that you do the hard work up front now to know your data and the value of your data. <clears throat> and so this concept of the paper tiger, as Joe had said earlier, is the unpracticed, the unpracticed um, response plan. And I've seen... I've seen many of these, and some of them are absolutely fantastic. Some of them are, you know, they're, they're brilliant um, until they're encrypted, until no one thought 
as Joe again alluded to, that you have a paper copy somewhere, somewhere protected, somewhere not lying around. Um, and sometimes it's best, right? Because when we talk about this, you know, the, the, the digital domain, I get it. It's easy sometimes for your eyes to kind of, you know, glaze over sometimes. It happens with my students all the time. Um, but so when you're thinking about, though, a response plan, um, think about it, you know, make it personal. For example, you know, think of a talent that you possess, right? Everyone has some talent that they do well. Uh, I don't know, piano playing, violin playing, uh, playing football, um, you know, swinging a bat, cooking a meal, what, whatever it is. Um, now imagine that you have to explain how to execute your talent. Let's say, you know, kicking football. Um, you have to explain to me how to do it. Um, planting your foot, the, the angle of your, of your, of your cook, the, the, the speed of your leg, et cetera, et cetera, right? All these, all these invariables. Um, but if I was to walk out to a football pitch without prior experience, right, even though I had your expert um, guide by my side, um, if I'm to do this using only the words that you've, that you've given me, I, I can promise you my success rate is going to be very, very low. And that's what I mean by the paper tiger problem. I can't tell you how many times in organizations, large and small, right, well-funded and mom and pop shops, domestic and international, I'm requested to view the document that is the, uh, the cyber extortion plan, the response plan. A couple things with this. One, it's often written by a third party. And again, that makes sense to some degree, right? A lot of people don't have, a lot of organizations don't have that kind of knowledge in-house. They go to a, go to a third party to write it. Makes sense. Um, but oftentimes that third party won't have a holistic understanding of your organization. And oftentimes, frankly, um, they just, they tear off the name of the corporation that paid them before you paid them and they sticky your name on top. Um, so in addition to this, so it's not just the response plan, it's the humanness, the human element of the negotiator as well, right? Because the, the negotiator is a critical element of this human to human crime. And the organizations that I've seen respond most efficiently to a ransomware event in addition to the ones that have thought about the data and the value of that data, are the ones that have welcomed negotiators into their planned rehearsals prior to vetting these negotiators, right? But but welcoming them in, saying, you're going to be a critical part of what we do here. Um, and the, the, the cost of, because no one has limited budget, but the cost of preparing correctly for one of these malicious events is minimal compared to the outlay cost of failure, right? So uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard ounce of prevention, pound of cure, ounce of prevention, pound of cure. If you're worried about budgets and everyone's worried about budgets, do the work beforehand and you'll save yourself scads of money. Rule four, <clears throat> look at yourself with the eyes of a predator. And so let's do another quick thought exercise here. What I respectfully request is in your mind's eye, or with the help of a pen, paper, whatever, type on the screen, think about your post. Because again, when Tracy asked me to do this, the first thing I did is I researched you all over the world. I researched post agencies all over the world. And the more I learned, the more worried I got for you. And here's why. In, in particularly in certain areas, posts are connected to particularly tempting targets in the eyes of a cyber criminal. Right? So, so either in your mind's eye or on a piece of paper, you know, put your put your your post in the middle of the page or the middle of your mind, and then draw lines from your organization to the organizations and institutions connected to you. For many of you, you will be connected to the sine qua non of the, of the um, 
cyber predator, which is the financial institution, a bank, a loan facility, a money order center. Well, let's not stop there. Once you've drawn that line and circled what you've what you're connected to, <clears throat> annotate the consequences that would result for you or that entity was hit by a cyber extortion crime. So, for instance, if you were hit, you know, it, it, you're, you're a post, right? So you deal with the transportation as good uh, transportation of goods as well as communications. But if you're tied in with a bank, there are innumerable more cascading consequences that, that can result. <clears throat> and you don't need me to tell you this, right? You're the expert here. You're the expert here. You know if you fail, if your partner organization fails, you know the consequences that will result to your region. And sometimes these, these rise to the level of nation state effects. And so what I exhort you to do is you can have a voice in this conversation of cyberspace. In fact, you are the most important people to have the voice because you know of the deleterious consequences that will happen if a malicious cyber attack was to occur against you or the bank that you're connected to. And what I'm trying to get you to do is advocate. Advocate for yourselves. Advocate for a small budget that says we need to prepare. Do we have a negotiator? Do we have a response plan? Who's our decision maker? Do we pay? Do we not pay? What data would make us pay? Why? To answer these questions that will become uh, much more complicated, again, in, in the cauldron of, a, of an actual event. And so, and, and, and once you have articulated those types of risks, that, that kind of interconnected web um, that will illuminate to those that you are trying to persuade a more accurate risk profile than just your individual post. And so to help us kind of understand this a little bit, let's let's take a look at some at some real world artifacts uh, and look at what happened to Royal Mail in the in the UK. And so Royal Mail, which if you're not familiar with it, please Google it. It's uh, it's great. Um, it's great because the negotiations uh, are online, which tells you something. Um, so, um, so it's not just it's not just on the nose, right? A, a post agency uh, hit by a debilitating cyber extortion um, event, um, but the 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 transcripts are open source, and you can see a lot by reading the transcripts, because both the criminal and the negotiator make mistakes. Um, the negotiator, you can also see, um, it knows the organization, and that's a critical factor. Uh, there's a reason why Royal Mail ultimately did not pay, uh, not least of which because the transcripts are on the web. Uh, but the Royal Mail, uh, the negotiator, uh, was familiar with the organization and was able to nimbly um, respond to some of the thrusts and parries of what the uh, criminal was uh, was trying to do. And so let's jump in both feet, right? So we arrive in the middle of the negotiations. The uh, the and you you can think of the so you have the victim negotiator and then you have the criminal. Sometimes um, I, I talk about the, the criminal negotiator as the criminal language and culture expert. And they're not necessarily the same person. Sometimes they're side by side. Sometimes there's, there's multiple people depending on the, on the complexity. Um, but you'll get a visceral sense if you read the transcripts of this Royal Mail that uh, these, are, these are human beings. And so, for example, um, the, the criminal says to Royal Mail, quote, if you were really worried about medical equipment, just pay for my work and get a decryptor within five minutes. You are making multi-billion dollar profits from your business and don't want to part with the money. Don't you think that's odd? It's your greed that makes the people who are waiting for their packages suffer, right? Because Royal Mail was like, wait a second. You know, they tried to appeal to the humanity of the criminal. They're like, people are going to get hurt. People might die. They're, they're not getting their medications. And, and so the, the criminal just, just comes back and says, no, 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 no. Um, it's essentially your corporate greed. Um, that's putting people at risk, uh, not not what I'm doing. Um, then the criminal asks, 
how much is your revenue? How much is your revenue? So, I mean, everyone right now, how would you respond to that question? What would you say? Do you know your data and its value? What would you say? Are you the decision maker? What is your level of confidence that if you're not the decision maker, the decision maker knows to a sufficient degree of accuracy what is right and wrong for your organization? Does your negotiator know your revenue? Do you even have a negotiator? If you have a negotiator, is that person sufficiently educated about your enterprise to answer the queries of a criminal in near real time? And what should the negotiator say anyhow? So in this instance, like I said, the negotiator was, was, was familiar, was pretty familiar with, with Royal Mail. Um, and it, it started to become clear that the criminal had made a mistake, right? So again, it's, it's, don't think of it as, a, as, as merely, uh, it, it's, a, it's a crime facilitated by technology, but, but, but done by human beings. And basically what happened was, and you can see this in the transcripts, is the, the criminal had mistaken Royal Mail for its parent company. Parent company of Royal Mail has some seriously deep pockets. Um, at the time, Royal Mail was was not doing well, right? It was, uh, and so, funny enough, uh, the victim negotiator actually sent an article from the UK Times saying, "We're not, I mean, Royal Mail's not doing well." You can you can read it literally about our losses um, in in the in the UK Times here, um, and uh, and and the uh, you, you can see you can see the criminal kind of. Uh, kind of uh oh, um, and and uh, it, it kind of it kind of goes downhill uh, for for the criminal from there. Um, but uh, please take a moment, read those, read those, read those negotiations, and consider the implications if you were in the hot seat, if your organization was in the hot seat, and how would you answer uh, those those queries? Final rule: don't go it alone. In the spring of 2022, two significant ransomware operations targeted uh, 27 Costa Rican government agencies, in addition to the country's healthcare system. So Costa Rica's government refused to pay, and um, the effects were, were serious. Um, uh, many government-run systems had to be taken offline, including those related to tax collection, medicine, social security. The uh, Costa Rican president, it was, it was a time of transition, uh, declared that Costa Rica was at war. Interesting, interesting language uh, in terms of uh, international law, that, uh, that Costa Rica was at war with the attackers. And there, was, there were attackers, there was basically two ransomware groups that were uh, attacking uh, Costa Rica. And the, the one who attacked Costa Rica second in time used... Uh, experiences and data that the first ransomware gang had leaked on the dark web, right? So the, the gangs were kind of learning from each other and using the information and passwords that had been um, posted on the dark web to further hurt uh, Costa Rica in the, in the second attack. So just to get a little bit more granular, in April of 2022, um, by the time that uh, it was the Costa Rican Ministry of, of Science, Innovation, Technology, and Telecommunications that was hit, um, they they realized that the finance ministry had been hit a few days earlier. And so the director of the Ministry of Science said that it was, in hindsight, it was poor communication between agencies meant that there was a little time to share details of the incident and, and a lack of situational awareness throughout the government, which made it easier for the dominoes to fall for more agencies to become uh, targets. And, uh, and it, 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 it got severe. The Treasury Department was hit, and uh, there was a message to civil servants saying, basically saying, you're, you're not going to get paid um, right now. But even though Costa Rica suffered this this debilitating event against against um, agencies, it didn't go it alone, <clears throat> and importantly, it had pre existing relationships that it could um, it could take advantage of. Immediately, Costa Rica reached out to Spain, the United States, Israel, and some of the private sector in, in the United States. And 
What did these relationships do for Costa Rica in this, in this moment of peril? Well, the United States offered technical assistance and also via the U.S. State Department, a reward of up to $10 million for information leading to the identification and or location of any individuals in the gang responsible for the attack. And so um, the, the Spanish, Spanish government donated tens of thousands of toolkits and also sent an entire cyber forensics team to Costa Rica to augment the Costa Rican cyber defenders. Israel. Israel, this is interesting, Israel and Costa Rica had signed a memorandum of understanding prior to the attack for cooperation in cybersecurity. So Israel provided relevant threat intelligence, increasing the, the visibility of the attack surface. The U.S. private sector rallied to Costa Rica's side in the guise of Cisco and Microsoft, again, providing uh, toolkits and, and helping resilience. And I wish I could say that Costa Rica recovered in, in early May. But again, we talked about the fluid dynamics of ransomware gangs and how they inform one another. And on the last day of the month, on May 31st, the second, I, I alluded to this before earlier, the second ransomware gang, again, leveraging those credentials that were listed on the dark web, again, hit Costa Rica. But again, Costa Rica had uh, had about a month of, of recovery and they had international relationships built. And so the good news is, that the second wave of attacks were far less effective than the first wave of attacks. Um, the, the economic loss was, was high. Um, estimates uh, range from 38 million to 125 million in the first 48 hours timeframe. In the wake of the cyber extortion crime against Costa Rica, uh, the nation did something extraordinary. And what I mean by that is Costa Rica did something forward. It contributed to the development of a customary international law of cyberspace, in particular, the subject of state sovereignty. In essence, what types of cyber harms will violate a nation's sovereignty? Costa Rica drew some red lines in the stand by stating that not only physical attacks, but also cyber operations that trigger a loss of functionality of cyber infrastructure located in the victim state constitute a violation of sovereignty. And, they, and it went further, saying that usurpation of inherently governmental functions is a violation of sovereignty. Now, that's consistent with the Talon Manual. Uh, you, you might be familiar with that, the Talon Manual, uh, on, uh, on the international law applicable to cyberspace. But Costa Rica went further, saying malicious cyber events interfering with the state's democratic process, such as elections um, and a choice of foreign policy, all potentially constitute violations of state sovereignty. And then went even further because Costa Rica say that certain categories of cyber surveillance operations can be conducted in such a manner that breaches state sovereignty and other rules of international law, which makes Costa Rica go further than Germany, Japan, Poland, Israel, that currently decline to tie surveillance options, uh, op operations to, to potential uh, violations of state sovereignty. But that's what's so important about what Costa Rica did. They took a stand. And I say all of this because there is present no concrete international law of cyberspace, because too many countries refuse to take a stand. They refuse to state unequivocally their position on the issue of state sovereignty in cyberspace and what harm may violate Article 2.4 of the UN Charter and which may give rise to self-defense to include preemption enshrined in Article 51. Help is available. Help is available. And I respectfully exhort everyone listening to become members of these important and burgeoning relationships. I know for a fact that the United States government has, uh, is in the, in, the, in the process of extending its hand um, internationally. U.S. Cyber Command can deploy hunt forward teams for defensive purposes and to increase local resiliency. In the past five years, U.S. Cyber Command has deployed 40 times to 21 countries. Uh, and, you know, in, in, to give just one, uh, in July of last year, um, Albania was targeted and U.S. Cyber Command sent a team of cyber operators and they stayed there for, for three whole months um, helping, helping um, Albania. In fact, relationship building is a backbone of the national cyber strategy of the United States. And the administration is on record looking to build um, – and partner with uh, with the international community. 
In fact, there's even a quote that says in, in the United States national security strategy that uh, U.S. foreign policy and cybersecurity goals are aided by international relationships. But the but partnerships alone can't be one-sided, and the United States right now is needs your help to maximize assistance efficiency. Decide how to prioritize who should receive cyber assistance and when, how to structure a mechanism that is sufficiently flexible to address the diverse circumstances in which requests for aid may arise, figuring out how to get U.S. funds to relevant foreign agencies. And it's not just the United States that's come to the conclusion that a rising tide raises all ships in the digital domain. In Europe, too, cyber defense was considered a primarily a, 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 a nation-state responsibility, but more recently, the European Commission has proposed the EU Cyber Solidarity Act, which, which looks to uh, enhance capabilities um, through partnerships to detect, prepare for, and respond to significant large-scale cybersecurity attacks. And so most of, this, most of these relationships uh, have been ad hoc. Um, but I think the moment is ripe. The moment is ripe for all of us to come together. Those of us that want uh, an international law of cyberspace that 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 bolsters and supports legitimate lawful behavior in the cyber domain to come together, share information, help each other. And so, um, if if you look at these five rules, so I'm just going to mention these five rules one more time, right? So cyber extortion gangs are criminal business enterprises, right? They're sophisticated. Um, the, uh, cyber extortion is, is facilitated by technology, but is a crime committed by people against people. You should have real-world response plans regularly tested and attended by relevant stakeholders, right? No paper tigers allowed. To extend the extent of your peril, look at yourself with the eyes of a predator and, and use a wide-angle lens, not just you know your, yourself, in the small sense, but who you are connected to and who is connected to you, and don't go it alone. Form helpful relationships, hopefully prior to uh, when you get hit. So if you take those five rules, um, you'll 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 put yourself in in a in a position of advocacy, right? Advocacy. Use that little bit up front, the hard work, and maybe a little bit of expenditure up front to save you uh, a lot of money and pain on the back end. So. Um, Tracy, I know we're, we're out of time formally, so I'll end there. But uh, but thank you so much, everyone. It's uh, It's been an honor to talk to you today. Thank you very much, James. Oh, that was wonderful. And I really appreciate you outlining those five rules, which I hope everybody took, took note of. Um, I think if, if nothing else, at the end of this um, webinar, we all would have that list of a very, very powerful um, Action or actions that we can take as an organization, even our individual as individuals, to to deal with um, proactive um, aspects of this as well as potentially reactive. Um, we, I do want to spend a little extra time, if you don't mind, um, treating with some of the um, questions that were asked. But before I do that, because I think I could do that by actually I, I copied and pasted over the question and answers, which. Joe has kindly um, dealt with all of them, which is quite fast. Thank you so much, Joe. So I think I'll share, I'll share the screens. I'll be very effective, um, which will kind of cover that. But uh, maybe one general question, which will kind of lead to, to sort of a summarized position. I think there's another one coming in, uh, which I could also ask. Oh, yes, it's just clarifying what AI and IA meant. So that's fine. Um, so now that we've spoken about this cyber... Um, attack anatomy issue. So we've dissected it. Um, Joe has given us some very practical, technical um, solutions, I think, to dealing with the problem, showing us exactly how uh, operators uh, intrude, infiltrate, and, and deal with it. And James has, has given us, I, I would suggest, um, I, what I would call the, the, I don't like to use the word soft, but certainly the, maybe the non-technical or the, the, the regulatory, the, the, the things that you can do that don't require you to necessarily, um, you know, use bits and bytes, so to speak. Um, so I think that's a, it's a good mix. So I have one final question for both, both of you. Given that the postal sector, which is the focus of this, but it's, I think it applies to everyone, 
um, has has been identified actually by both of you as becoming um, more and more susceptible to these attacks. Um, given the situations we are facing, we're hearing more of them. Some are in the news, some are not. Is there one cardinal rule, I think, that you would, would suggest that um, these organizations, everybody, including the Post, can do right now, like today? You leave this webinar, you, you need to do something right now. What would you suggest that you can do at this moment, everything else you said, we know that could take some time, but right now, this moment, after the, you've had your lunch or you've had your dinner, as the case maybe, or your breakfast, what can you do right now? So maybe I'll start with Joe. What is one thing you suggest someone can do right now? <laughs> so, I mean, there's there's lots of things you can do which are very basic uh, that can make a massive difference. I mean, one of the, one of the biggest things is, is, is multi-factor authentication. It's just having employees using that uh, in as many places as possible. Um, but if, the one thing I would highly recommend is, is, is going and, you know, taking a backup of your backup, uh, and storing it offline. It, it's, it, that is probably the biggest difference that I see in organizations, you know, having the ability to recover is having a good solid backup to go to. And that, that it, it makes a difference. That's, that's the one mistake that I see constantly all the time is that the backup's encrypted, the backup's encrypted. Um, and that's where really the organization and, and, and the, the service starts having that negotiation with the, with the criminals is because they're, they're, there's no alternatives. Um, so, you know, one thing I, I practice, what I do is I, I have backups of backups. And then on a monthly basis uh, or a quarterly basis, I rotate the disks. Um, so at least I know that my worst case scenario um, is that I have a, a three month uh, old backup that I can go to, and that's the worst case scenario. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend if you know if you want to make sure that you can survive. That's this is a survivability technique to make sure that you can continue. Um, it doesn't stop it from happening. It doesn't uh, stop the attackers from stealing data, but it means that at least from a business perspective, you can continue because ultimately this is where. A lot of the scenarios is that uh, when when victims start having the, the discussions about paying the ransom, um, it gets into a very tricky situation. Especially in some countries, as, as Jim, you know, alluded to, it was around you know, uh, you know uh, sanctions as well play a big part in regulatory and and, and uh, some of these uh, criminal operators operate in countries where there's sanctions in place. So how do you pay them? Um, so it's really important to make sure you know is that you don't have to get that situation. So yeah, go back. Take a backup of your backups and, and store it offline for, for that rainy day when, when, when you need to use them. Very sound advice. And, and to be frank, we've, and other webinars that we've had, that we've, that's been the, the one message that you know, have a plan A, plan B, plan <laughs> yeah. C, and sometimes even a plan D. <laughs> to just ensure that you are well prepared. Backup of your backup. Some people even say backup of your backup of your backup. <laughs> I'm sure that's yeah because that that's the key. Um, James, one thing you can we can do right now. Today, I would have I would set a meeting with all relevant stakeholders, and so relevant to you might be the bank that you're attached to, uh, or it might be your decision makers, uh, uh, or it might be a combination thereof. Right, but set a meeting today. Get everyone that's that is a stakeholder in your post and start talking about what happens when we get hit. Thank you, James. Um, I'm seeing, I'm not sure if it's a question, but I think it's a comment coming in from Calvin Ramna saying, I agree, Joseph, we were hit by a major ransomware attack earlier this year. We were able to recover from our off, from our off I think that's offline backups. Because our primary backups were also compromised. So I think that's yeah. re-emphasizing your, your, your point. No, it's it's the survivability. Um, you know, definitely. You know, to James's point, one of one of the other you know recommendation is is that. So when you're dealing with security responses today, are no longer just IT incidents; they are actually business incidents, and that's the big difference. Is you know the business can't just say IT go and fix this and recover and get us back up and running. That's not the case anymore. This this is a business response. So you know to to go, extend it on what James has mentioned is that. This really means that all stakeholders of the business 
have to actually already you know make sure that they have a business crisis plan for these types of incidents uh, because it is a business response not an IT response and therefore it means that you need to go through and simulate practice coordinate across the business all functions HR to the executive team to the boards to, to your suppliers to your customers everyone needs to be uh, you know let's say you know, coordinated in those types of responses and that's why um, you know have, having this as a business crisis and response uh, is vital and treated like that. Thank you. And maybe before we leave, I can just share my screen. I think you should be seeing mm -hmm. the questions. So I redacted the yeah. the names of the the questioners just for the um, since sure. it's going on for, going on live. But for those who are on the Zoom, you can go to the Q and A box and see who asked the questions. Yeah. So, let, yeah, let, let uh, me let me just yeah, Teresa, yes. let me elaborate on those those exactly. answers just Appreciate just so that. so people understand. The, the first question is you know about a ransomware resilient backup. In in the backup scenario, I mean that's that's my history. That's where I've spent a lot of time in my my career was in in the back. I was a backup uh, administrator. I worked for backup vendors over the years. And one of the things here is that you know the backups should only have access to the production environment and not vice versa. So whatever credentials you have. Uh, should not be a flat should not be a flat network and it should not your production should not be able to communicate into your backup segmentation so the backup should only be basically retrieving data from production and it should not be bi-directional uh, the only time you enable that is during restoration you know when you need to restore that's the only time you can actually pull from the backup environment um, so having those completely seg segmented segregated um, and having different uh, you know credentials um, is is vital um, and then to the point, you know, having that that final one, which is the offline one, uh, which you can go to. Um, the second question here was around, uh, you know, evidence gathering. Um, one thing that I typically do is using uh, FTK Imager that allows me to take basically uh, live images of machines that are, are infected. Um, and then I take those off. Uh, so that's the, you know, making sure that you have the ability to take in those live images. You've got full disk images. They're quite large. This is where you have to you know, make sure that you understand about what type of disk space that you need for those. They are actually quite large images. Um, you can take them in, 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 in raw images, uh, which allows you to pr do proper investigations later before you go and start you know, recovering and, and going through, for example, imaging processes or restoration. Um, there's lots of different tools out there, but that's one that I primarily kind of, that's my go-to one that I use uh, quite often in, in, in live incidents. Um, the encryption, yes, is typically the last uh, phase, um, uh, but you know that's why uh, I go going through that same process of having that rotation. Um, one I have seen in one case uh, where it was a large telco uh, organization that became a victim, and they actually had their backups were not infected, um, and they restored them only to find out that the ransomware was actually backed up into the backup. So they actually restored the ransomware back into production. And it was only a matter of a few weeks later that they were uh, uh, infected again. And that made it a, a significant issue because where previously they'd only lost 15 days of data, um, now because of that situation, they had now lost 45 days of data uh, because they found out that the backup was also infected. Uh, so also make sure you do an integrity check and, and validate the backups uh, and, and check for IOCs within uh, uh, the backup environment. Uh, the one here also about lateral movements, absolutely. This is the major issue, and that's why you use privilege access management, you use password rotation, you use multi-factor authentication within sensitive areas in the network. Um, so yes, uh, LAPS is great for you know managing uh, privileges and privilege elevation, um, but I highly recommend that you create very comp complex passwords for especially your privilege accounts, um, and that you make sure that you rotate the credentials after use. By rotating after use means that even if I do capture those credentials in clear text or I get the hash, I can't move laterally in the network with those because the password's already been rotated after using. So this is where you start thinking about getting your disclosure rate down to as uh, you know zero as possible, um, or what I refer to as least standing privileges or zero persistent privileges. Um, that will definitely deal with those types of incidents. There is a question here in the chat, uh, in the question and answer as well around cyber insurance. Um, so one thing is I just done research in cyber insurance um, and just that I did a massive talk recently in uh, the ISC2 Congress in the US uh, on that specific topic. 
one of the things is that cyber insurance is it's a financial risk uh, uh, alternative. So um, if you get cyber insurance, cyber insurance is not an alternative to security, but it is a uh, ability that if if you look at what it takes to recover from a cyber attack, uh, and if you don't have that financial means available to you, cyber insurance tends to give you uh, the financial ability to recover. Um, so cyber insurance should be uh, a consideration uh, if you find that you don't have excess funds available. Some organizations go into what's called the cyber captives. Cyber captives is where you insure yourself. Um, for example, the large case a few years ago with Target, uh, Target had multiple policies, uh, but one of the big policies they had was a cyber captive that also gave them additional funds to recover as well. Uh, but it, you know, today it's getting more difficult. It means that to get cyber insurance, you typically will have to go through and already have done very good, uh, uh, let's say, you know, risk uh, mitigation already. The one here in AI, yes, criminals are using AI today already, um, but they're they're not using they're using it for mostly automation and pretexting capabilities. So what happens is they're using uh, AI or generative AI in order to automatically respond uh, to make the interaction with victims more seamlessly. Uh, they're using it for language translations. For example, I'm based in Estonia. Estonia really didn't have a massive issue with phishing and social engineering uh, because the Estonian language was almost you know something that protected them for a long time because it was the attackers could not really get it translated really well with the existing tools that they had. And the only ones that they were able to do successfully is where they actually paid language translators in order to translate the phishing campaigns for them. That's the ones that actually were more targeted. Uh, but now with generative AI, uh, the automatic language translations that are in real time uh, make those attacks, which were more difficult with the Stony language, much more easier to do today and more easier to you know, pretend to be legitimate services. So we're seeing social engineering uh, accelerate further with the use of pretexting, and that pretexting has been driven by generative AI and automation. Thank you very much, um, Joe, for uh, providing some color again to your responses. Appreciate that. No James, did you have anything to add to this? Do you want to say anything, having seen the Q&A, and, and do you have any um, yeah. thoughts on this? And maybe what you can do is um, pull that into your final um, words on today's webinar. Sure. I, th I think, uh, yeah, one, one, one quick word on cyber insurance is um, be careful. Lloyd's of London came out uh, in March of this year saying that if it was proven and it's difficult to understand who's who has to do the proving, is it the victim or is it the the insurer, um, that if it's proven that, it, that it's a nation state actor, they're not going to pay up. And so that kind of sent some shockwaves through the cyber insurance uh, market because um, it's hard sometimes to dissimulate uh, a nation state actor from a proxy um, and what does that mean from an insurance perspective, especially when some nation states um, allow uh, malicious uh, actors um, to, to work uh, very freely uh, within their borders. So um, just with that one caveat, no, just say, look, um, you can uh, ounce of prevention, pound of cure, ounce of prevention, pound of cure in this space. It doesn't cost a lot of money uh, to take some uh, necessary steps. And there's just... Yeah, just an additional on that is is that it's it's still up for a massive debate right now because a lot of the cyber insurance policies they do have what's called those exclusions and limitations, and those exclusions typically have things like uh, that you know there's no claim in active war, or active terrorism, and stuff like that. Um, now, in regards to the postal services, this this gets into a bit of a gray area um, because the recent case against Merck um, earlier this year um, and their insurers they had about twelve insurance policies uh, that they activated and made claims from the NotPetya attack back in 2016. Now, in that particular case, um, Merck went and, and you know, triggered their insurance policies, uh, which was 700 million uh, in claims um, of that particular ransomware case of NotPetya. Now, the insurers, mo most of the insurers came back and said that due to the exclusion of active war, that they would not pay out those claims. Um, and it went to basically court case. Uh, earlier this year in May, that uh, Supreme Court in the US finally concluded that the active war clause exclusion in the insurance policy was not justified because Merck themselves are not a legitimate target uh, in a war. 
so therefore that exclusion would not be applied. So what happened was the Supreme Court favored uh, with Merck that the exclusion was not a valid exclusion, and therefore they won a 1.4 billion payout uh, in the insurance case. Now, that brings up a bit of a debate into, okay, what is legitimate government targets <laughs> um, in an act of war? Uh, and that's still something that is uh, unclear. So those who are you know, considered not legitimate, you know, pharmaceutical hospitals and so forth, uh, those exclusions would be, for example, not held up in court. Uh, but organizations that do hold of legitimate government relations, you know, those who are supplying, let's say, uh, governmental services, um, might find themselves a bit of a tricky situation whether that clause will apply or not. So um, until we have more cases like this, uh, the debate will still continue. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I really appreciate the time, extra time we spent with us today. I really appreciate it. I think the information shared was extraordinarily valuable, and I'm, I'm absolutely sure our colleagues online will uh, indicate as such to us. Um, fantastic questions coming in as well. Uh, one of the, uh, I, I did indicate to you before uh, we started that I wasn't sure how many questions we'll get and we actually got a flood of questions. So I was really um, appreciated from the engagement. So thank you everyone for participating. Um, for those who are asking, yes, the recording will be available online. We would notify um, um, all of you who are participating, who signed up, who registered. Uh, where that will be, it will be ideally, uh, just to confirm on the UPU's um, YouTube channel, and you can contact us via this uh, information I'm just putting in the chat for more information about what we do at the Dot Post Business Management Unit at the UPU. Um, feel free to contact us, um, and for those who are in the sector, please do let, uh, let us know if you would like to get involved with the dot post um, project, um, which will further provide resilience to your environment accordingly. So with that, um, do enjoy the rest of everyone's day. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, James. Um, really appreciate you joining us for this webinar. Um, last day of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Keep away. Don't let the month end. And just we, we, we drop our guard. Let's keep going. And let's ensure that our organizations are well protected and you yourself as an individual take necessary cyber hygiene steps, to protect yourself and your organization and even at home um, where you're um, doing your own work because that could infiltrate into your environment at the office as well. Thank you once again. And with that, I say bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of your day or night or evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.